But I ran through the security guard, ran through the, the metal detector, jumped into the elevator, and I hit the top floor. I go to the front desk and I tell the lady, I'm here to meet with your director of marketing, but I don't remember her name. I said, it's, it's, she says, Martha? I said, yes, Martha. Martha comes out and says, I am so sorry. Did we have a meeting? So I gave her a 60 second elevator pitch on who I was, asked her for an opportunity, and about a week later, we had the Los Angeles Kings as a client. Did you have that moment where you almost could have given up? You need to think bigger, be bigger. You, if you can imagine it, you can achieve it. If there's a car that's manufactured, why can't you drive in it? If there's a place on earth that you can visit, why can't you visit it? If there's a plane that exists, why can't you be on it? He was literally instilling in me this idea that anything was possible. Thank you, thank you for having me. So can you tell me a little bit about who you are so the audience can know? Sure, so I'm the grandson of an immigrant from Cuba who fled communism in the 50s, came to the United States to pursue the American dream. He wanted to leave Cuba, come to the United States and build a life for his family. So he came um, in the 50s and he landed in Los Angeles, actually in Watts, and he saved up enough money uh, to finally start his own company. My grandfather, when he left Cuba, like I said, he wanted to be independent from the government, and he knew that America provided that opportunity. So he did not want to work for anybody, and he didn't want to depend on the government. So he became an entrepreneur, started a company that still exists today in South Central LA. My father runs that company. So he instilled that entrepreneurial spirit in, into my father, who then instilled it into me. And uh, 20 years ago, I started my own company, built it to what is now considered one of the fastest growing companies in America, minority owned. What's and it called? It's traffic advertising. So we do advertising and marketing. A lot different than what my grandfather started. My grandfather started a very blue collar line of business, metal finishing. It's very dirty, very toxic, um, but it's all he knew how to do. When he came here, that was one of his first jobs. So he saved up enough money and and bought, he bought a metal finishing line and that's what he did. And when my, when my father became of age, 18, 19, he brought my father into the business to run it because he still struggled with English and just kind of understanding business. My, my father, who came uh, to the United States when he was six months, and I grew up in America, so he understood it. So my father took over that business. When I was 18, I actually started to work for that company for about three months, but I was fired. Um, you were fired? My father fired me because he, he said, you know what, there's only enough room uh, in this company for two Traminos and you need to find your own way. He said, I took over the family business, but you need to find your own way, pave your own path. Reluctantly, I did so. I'm so grateful that I did because 20 years ago I started this company, a small little 200 square foot office in Downey, California and uh, humble beginnings. So when I started this company, my wife and I were very young. Uh, we had our first child and we were struggling to make ends meet. And we didn't want to depend on our parents, just like my grandfather didn't want to depend on anyone. He instilled that in me as well. And so there were times where my wife and I were eating hamburger helper without the meat. Our lights were getting turned off. Um, we were struggling to make our rent, but I knew that, you know, through hard work and perseverance, so we'd make it and we did. And thank God we did. And I started that company. And, uh, you know, 20 years ago and through a lot of hard work, sweat equity, uh, a lot of sacrifice and the grace of God, uh, I was able to build it up over 20 years and we are now a global agency. We do work with Fortune 500 companies and startups. Uh, it's been an incredible journey. And um, What was that journey like? Can you tell me a little bit more? Yeah. Some of the stories? <laughs> as far as the business is concerned? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so back then, you know, I, I graduated high school but I didn't, I didn't finish college. I started college three times, dropped out all three times. Um, the early years were just hard work. I'll, I'll tell you a story about how uh, one of our very first clients, and it, it's, do. it's a testament to anyone out there who's, who's, who thinks that you have to follow a traditional path or you, you know, that you're gonna struggle to overcome obstacles. I, I knew I wanted to get this company off the ground, but I knew no one would talk to us. Um, we didn't take out a loan to start the company. We had, you know, very little, just two desks and this office. And I said, hey, 
let's swing for the fences. It's the same amount of work to try to find a small company or try to, try to win business from a small company as it is a mega company. So I decided, who do I want to work with? At the time, I was a huge sports fan. So I said, I want to work for the Lakers. So I showed up one day to Staples Center. Right outside of Staples Center, there's a building. AEG occupies that building. There's three companies in that building. Los Angeles Galaxy, Los Angeles Kings, and the Los Angeles Lakers. Stood outside that building and I said, okay, I got to get in here. I got to give my elevator pitch. So I stood outside and I realized they weren't letting people in. There was a security guard. You had to have an appointment. You had to have credentials. Stood out there for 45 minutes, watched people go in. And um, you'd have to walk in, go through a security um, sensor and meet with the security guard before you get into the elevator. I watched this lady walk up. As the security guard is looking through her purse, the purse spills on the floor. Everything falls out. Security guard gets on his knees to help her put the things back into her purse. I see an opportunity. I, <laughs> I tell the story now because it all worked out, but I ran through the security guard, w ran through the, the security detector, the metal detector, jumped into the elevator, and I hit the top floor. It was only three floors, so I hit three. I knew when that door opened, it was either going to be Lakers, Kings, or uh, Galaxy. As soon as the door opened, hockey paraphernalia all over the place. It was the Los Angeles Kings. So I go to the front desk and I tell the lady, I'm here to meet with your director of marketing, but I don't remember her name. I said, it's, it's, she says, Martha. I said, yes, Martha. I didn't have an appointment. Martha comes out and says, I am so sorry. Did we have a meeting? I, I, was, I was unaware. I, I didn't know we had a meeting. I'm so sorry. I said, actually, we don't have a meeting. But let me tell you who I am. Let me tell you why it matters. I gave her a 60 second elevator pitch on who I was, asked her for an opportunity. And about a week later, we had the Los Angeles Kings as a client, which then led to the Los Angeles Galaxy, which was the beginning foundation for the company I built over 20 years. That's incredible. Yeah, it's an interesting story. But um, this 20 years, I mean, it, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of hard work, a lot of perseverance. There were, there were times that I didn't know, you know, how we, I went, I went at one time eight months without paying myself so that I can pay my employees. Um, how was it like? It was tough. I leaned a lot on faith. I leaned a lot on some of the principles that my grandfather taught me, perseverance, leaning in. Um, you know. Can you tell me a little bit about your childhood? How was that growing up? And um, your Latino roots? Yeah. So I told you I'm part Cuban, but I'm also part Mexican. I was born in the United States, so I always say I'm 100% American. So my mom was about 12 years old. They moved down to California, Carson, Torrance area, and started a life here because my grandfather truly understood that he needed to expose them to more. He needed to give them city life. He wanted to inspire them and encourage them to see different things than they would see in Montana and, and really start to trigger curiosity, creativity. So he did that. My, my mom and dad met when they were 17. They had me young. Unfortunately, as with many Hispanic families, that relationship didn't work. I was the only child from my mom and dad who then remarried and you know had <laughs> beautiful marriages and i had siblings but i'm i'm the only product of that relationship so you know growing up was a little difficult going from home to home having you know product of i want to say divorce but they had never gotten married so product of a split family going back and forth i lived with my mom till i was 12 moved in with my father during my high school years my mom felt like i needed to have my father's oversight in my life when I was in high school, which was a good thing. And that's where he instilled in me that entrepreneurial spirit. It was funny, my dad used to, when I was young in high school, my dad used to take me to various cities, um, like Long Beach, Newport Beach, Beverly Hills. He would drive me out there and I didn't really know why at first, but we'd get off, we'd usually walk through communities and he'd have me always on these, on these excursions, he'd have me pick out a house. He's like, pick out the house you would want to live on on this street. Okay, that one. He's like, now tell me something. Why can't you have that house one day? What's stopping you and preventing you from living on this street? 
said, you, that's the only thing. You got to believe in yourself. You got to believe that you belong here. You got to believe that you can achieve this. And once you start believing that you can, speaking that you can, then you can manifest that. And he taught me that when I was in high school, which I now teach my kids. We have this philosophy. If you can, you got to see it, you got to believe it, you got to speak it, and then you can manifest it. So that's what my dad taught me during my high school years. And um, it was pretty profound, especially coming from a Hispanic family, because I have, I have cousins, for example, who, when you think about conversations that happen around their dinner table, about the future, about success, dreaming, most Hispanic households that I was familiar with, especially in my own family, they, the extent that they wanted you to dream was they, figured, they felt like your goal should be a, acquiring a good job that has good benefits, work your entire life, and be able to retire comfortably. That was the goal. I have cousins who were brought up in environments where that was what you should strive for. Just get a good, a decent job that you can keep forever, that puts food on the table, where you can retire with good benefits. Where my dad, on the other hand, was telling me, you need to think bigger, be bigger. You, if you can imagine it, you can achieve it. If there's a car that's manufactured, why can't you drive in it? If there's a place on earth that you can visit, why can't you visit it? If there's a plane that exists, why can't you be on it? He was literally instilling in me this idea that anything was possible. And that's not very common in the Hispanic household. And it was very different than my cousins were getting and very different than my friends were getting. So I attribute a lot of my success to those conversations I had with my father where he, he forced me and pushed me to, to dream bigger and, and to not really have a plan B in life. And I kind of developed that over time and I instilled that in my kids. I basically tell them, you need to know what you want and you need to pursue it relentlessly. And you cannot have a plan B because the moment that you have a plan B, you've already conceded to the potential outcome of you not achieving your primary goal. So never have a plan B, always a plan A. Now you may start to pursue your plan A and you may find obstacles along the way, but you need to learn how to pivot, go around them, go above them, go below them, figure out a way of still achieving your goal even if the path you thought you were going to take looks a little different. But the moment you say, I want this, but if that doesn't happen, I'll settle for this, it's almost certain that you're going to end up with this. Was there ever a fork in the road where you could have gone to that, just stayed in the stable type of lifestyle that your um, other cousins and family members would have had? Did you have that moment where you almost could have given up? Early on, when I was younger, I could have easily not pursued becoming an entrepreneur, finding my own path. Could have easily begged my father to stay in the business. Could have easily just continued that. It was a simple conversation. I could, I could have gotten him or negotiated that. Um, I could have, you know, early on, I, I had good jobs at, at corporations. Um, I could have stayed there. But I think at various times in my life, I had a different different circumstances that motivated and propelled me forward. Very first one would be having a child so young. I was 21. My wife was 19. We had our first son. The moment I found that she was pregnant, I absolutely knew that child's going to be born in his own house and we're not going to need to depend on our parents to raise him. And that was the first fork in the road where I said, we're going to do this. I'm going to figure it out. I'll work two jobs, three jobs, four jobs to ensure that I can provide that foundation for my family. So I did that. Then another fork in the road, when I had my child and I had a good job, I was working for one of the biggest telecom communication companies in the world, WorldCom. I was making 20, 20 years ago, $100,000 a year. Today, that would still be a good job. 20 years ago, that was an amazing job. I had started this company traffic um, while working at that other company. And what I would do is I would, I would go to work, I'd get off, go have dinner with the family, and then put the kids to bed, and then go into that little tiny 200 square foot office and make calls all night. 
nobody was there, so I had to leave voicemails. This was before Google, so I was using uh, uh, the yellow pages. But I would call and, and try to build this company. For six months, I had both, right? I had my, my paying job, and I was trying to start this company. And I had a partner, my best friend from high school. And um, one day, he calls me, and he says, hey, we need to talk. So I left my, my, my job at WorldCom, drove all the way to that little office, and I walk in, and it's him, his wife, and my wife. And as soon as I walk in, I said, what is this, an intervention? Like, <laughs> what's going on here? Like, yeah. uh, you know, I've heard about these things, but I'm not an alcoholic, I'm not addicted to drugs. Like, why are you, what do you guys want to talk to me about? Um, it was him struggling with the fact that the inconsistency in, in pay when you're an entrepreneur and you're starting your own company was not something that he could bear anymore. He needed to go back into um, consistent, steady work. And so he basically was quitting on me um, and telling me that he had to leave. Mind you, while he's quitting on me, the phone is ringing in the background, but I can't answer it because I'm dealing with this. So him and his wife, they leave and my wife leaves and I'm sitting there in that room alone. It was another fork. It was, what do I do? I could easily just lock this door, break my lease, go back to my good paying job, never look back. I said, but that's not what's in me. That's not what I want. That's not what I worked so hard to achieve. And as I sat there and I, and I finally reconciled and said, this is the farthest I've ever taken an idea. I'm not gonna give up now. I got up, I was about to leave, and I thought, well, let me go check that voicemail. So I walked to the desk, checked the voicemail. While he was quitting on me, there was a client I had been reaching out to for three months, trying to get a job from, who had just left me a voicemail saying, hey, your persistence paid off. I have something for you. Come see me on Monday. I have a project for you. That project ended up being the equivalent of what I was getting paid each month at WorldCom, I was able to quit, went full-time into traffic, never looked back. What other ways, um, or are there ways that you help the uh, Latino community or the community in general that you give back? Is there? Number one, I think that my story is an inspirational story for a lot of people who do not believe that they can or should achieve greatness. I think that my whole life serves as an example that people could gain insight from, be inspired by and encouraged by. Aside from that, I'm a big philanthropist. I believe in the fact that to whom much is given, much is required. And so I do everything that I can to align with organizations that share my values. And specifically, and those values um, are you know, women and children. I just have a heart for women and children. Not that I don't for men, but I think that, I think that we are called as men um, to carry the burden, shoulder the burden um, of society. But women and children have always had um, my heart, specifically children that are in the foster care system. So I work with organizations like Olive Crest um, who, who take kids out of the system and try to provide uh, a loving environment, hopefully adoptions, but if not, foster care. Um, but my work with them has been specifically with the 12 to 18 year olds, because I learned something. I learned that once you become 12 years old and you're in the foster care system, you're no longer adoptable. They will not allow you to get adopted. So you stay in the system from 12 to 18 until you're old enough, and then they just move you out of the system. But the statistics with regards to adults, 18-year-old and 19-year-old adults who have been through the system uh, who end up in prison and jail is just through the roof. It's 80 to 90 percent. I don't have the exact figure, but it's astronomical that you'll end up in prison at least once in your life. And, um, and then you talk about with, with the girls, teen pregnancies, et cetera, which then leads to um, a perpetuation of that system, right, of, of kids um, needing homes and so my, my heart is for the homeless we work with Union Rescue Mission we work with um, other nonprofits in what way well I I learned early on that 
it would be easy for me to cut a check, but it doesn't really do anything for my soul. So I do both. I only align with organizations, Miracles for Kids, Olive Crest, all helping families, women and children, but I only give when I can meet with the executive directors and say, here's how I'm gonna give. I'll give financially, but I need, I need to give physically. I need to be part of it. I need to be ingrained with what you're doing. So our giving with uh, Olive Crest, for an, as an example, is not just financial, but you know, for six, six times a year, we were holding workshops for the kids, bringing them in, giving them um, job advice, life advice, spiritual advice, uh, mentorship. Um, we were connecting with them, um, you know, just getting involved and engaged with Miracles for Kids that helps families that have a child that has a terminal illness. It's about engaging the families, um, helping to build Miracle Manor, which is um, housing for them, um, being, you know, being part of the organization to actually be feet on the street to interact with these individuals and help and to get just love on them. So. Yes, I cut checks, but more importantly, if I can't physically be connected and engaged, then I don't want to be part of that because I think this is a lesson for everybody. When you give to organizations like that, when you give to communities, um, it changes to some extent their situation, but it absolutely, to a core level, changes you. And I think that I've been changed more by my giving of these organizations and I can ever change their situations and for that I'm truly blessed. So you don't take it for granted where you're at? Not at all. I remember vividly the reason why I say you know the hamburger helper without the meat because I vividly remember that and I'm grateful for that honestly. Um, and there were other situations. I there are other situations. I mean our very our, <laughs> our very first car my wife and I Finally saved up em enough money to buy our first car. It was a Honda Civic. And somebody had to co-sign for it because we didn't even have the credit for it. Five days after we got that car, I was driving on the freeway. This was before cell phones, so I, wasn't, I was paying attention. But I rear-ended a car, completely damaged the hood of that car, that vehicle. About a month later, the insurance company sent us a check for $900 to fix that dent. But for me during that time, it was fix the dent or pay your rent. So we paid rent with it. So for the five years that we had that car, that, that car was never fixed. When I turned that car in five years later, it still had the dent in it. Those humble beginnings of, of having to prioritize expenses, those, those moments of having our lights turned off, <laughs> of having a cardboard box for um, a coffee table, a plastic dining uh, set for a, a dining a dining table. Uh, we had a borrowed refrigerator that didn't work. Um, those were all things that at the time we were just grateful for. And so now, because I've worked hard and and I have means, um, I never stop reminiscing and thinking about those days because they made me who I am. I can appreciate now the things that I have at a level many others can't because I know what it's like not to have them. So I'm not materialistic. The things that I have, I, I don't covet because they don't make me. They are not, they're not the source of my happiness and therefore I don't put too much stock in them. It's nice to have things, it is. And I would say to anybody who, who thinks that we as Hispanics, um, should be martyrs and suffer and work hard and not have sick. No, you can help more people when you're wealthy than you can when you're poor. Now, I'm going to take a little bit back because you sure. mentioned that you're Cuban and Mexican. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there's a lot of Latinos from a lot of different places and some of them don't get along. And that's some of the problems that they mentioned, you know, mm -hmm. like if we all come together and help each other, um, and you're interesting because you sometimes, you know, there's sayings that Mexicans or Cubans, you know, just, just to say for, as an example, don't get along, but y you're a proof that it's not true you know, <laughs> in, in that sense. So what would you say to them? I mean, we can't get caught up on the things that make us different. Yeah. We have to focus on the things that unite us. If you look at society as a whole today, government, politics, media, 
they do a great job helping us identify all the things that make us different. So we need to do an even better job identifying those things that unite us. And I think at the end of the day, you know, we were all created in God's image. And as long as generationally, you know, we allow ourselves to only find the things in us that are different, we will never progress as a culture and we'll never progress as a society. And we're doing the world an injustice. So I would, I would urge everyone to, to find those things that unite us and to bring us together. And, and although Hispanics are technically made up of over 20 countries, at the end of the day, we love tradition, we love culture, we love family, we love God. Let's focus on that. Those are the most important things anyway. And what's next for Anthony? What's next for Anthony is, um, like I was mentioning, it's significantly important that Hispanics, especially here in America, specifically here in California, understand their role in politics, understand how important and significant it is that they get involved in government. And so this next year for me is going to involve me stepping away a little bit from my business, from being an entrepreneur and focusing on my role in government and politics, because we need to be the change that we want in the world. And it's not going to happen until more of us stand up, um, get in the fight, understand how government works, engage, and start to be the policy makers that will put forth the laws that will change the things that bother us. So I'm campaigning to be governor of California. I believe that California needs Hispanic representation. I'm a melting pot. California is a melting pot. I'm a melting pot, being, his, uh, being Cuban and Mexican. What we're going to focus on over the next 12 months is really activating the Hispanic demographic. It's educating them on government, how it works, how to get involved, why your voice matters, why your vote matters. We're going to rally the Hispanic community unlike we've ever seen in California because it's time that our representatives look more like us, act more like us, talk more like us, and, and know what we go through uh, more than people have previously. So we're going to go out, we're going to educate, we're going to inspire, we're going to encourage, we're going to get people registered, and we're going to get them motivated to go out and vote. And then, should I be blessed with an opportunity to actually sit in Sacramento, we're going to start to change our school systems. We're going to focus on creating leadership platforms so that more Hispanics um, are exposed to entrepreneurialism and they dream bigger, think bigger, have the tools and resources they need to succeed. Um, so we can break generational curses and really create a platform for people to achieve so much more. And we're going to focus on housing, which is obviously uh, a, a serious issue in the Hispanic community. Um, but education, housing, um, and, and really creating opportunity for Hispanics to really own their place in California, in the United States, and in the world. You just mentioned something very interesting previously, where if you have wealth, if you have something, then you could provide more assistance. Look, the, the more we help businesses grow, the more prosperous they become, the bigger they become, the more jobs they create, the more taxes they create, it's better for the community. There's this great lie that we should tax and punish big corporations um, and somehow that's going to help the middle class. But at the end of the day, here's how it works. If we tax and punish big corporations, what are they going to do? They're going to leave California. If they leave California, what happens? They take their jobs. So there's less jobs in California. They take their tax dollars. So all of a sudden you have these big corporations leaving. They take their tax dollars. They take their jobs. How's the, how's the middle class better off? There are less jobs. And somebody's going to have to pick up the burden of those taxes that are left. So it gets imposed on the middle class. So what we need to do is we need to support small business. We need to, I mean, you know, some big corporations with a thousand employees are, are affected by our mandates, our regulations, our taxes, just as much as my grandfather's business. You know, my, my father's business, he's, I believe they, they have 12 to 15 employees, very small, still a humble business. Obviously he provides for his family, but at the end of the day, the, the laws, the regulations, the taxes, they're choking him out too. And so we're not creating an environment for our youth to be inspired to establish businesses and small businesses are being crushed 
restaurants, salons that are usually family owned businesses um, where they live hand to mouth, check to check. Um, over the last you know, 18 months, they've been devastated. They've been crushed, suffocated. We have Central California with huge agriculture being crushed um, because of regulations and lack of water. And, and so m what I'm gonna do is for the good of all of California, not just for the Hispanics, but because I am Hispanic, because that is part of my story, I, I understand better than our politicians some of the policies and laws that need to be addressed so that Hispanics, other minorities, Asians, um, black Americans can have opportunities that don't exist today. Well, thank you very much, Anthony, for being today, coming here today for this interview on Impactful Latinos. Well, thank you for having me.